Good morning. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about adding a control module to the microprocessor that we have already worked with. To jog your memory, uh, maybe it was this week, maybe it was way back in week one, uh, you should have worked with a microprocessor that looked something like this. And if you want the full details, go back to that microprocessor demo. I'm just going to give a quick summary right here. So the key idea is that this is a microprocessor without control. By that I mean I, as the human, have to manually flip these switches at the appropriate times in the proper sequence in order to process my input data to convert it into output data. And I'm not actually passing in data correct data directly with the control. Instead, I'm accessing data from memory. So let's say, for example, I want to add two numbers together. Well, I'm going to set my A value here, my B value there. I'm going to select my B data to be read onto the data bus, routed up into this temporary register where it sits there for a clock cycle. On that next clock cycle, we are going to select the A data, maybe it's coming from ROM0, and we are going to route it down this path from the DMUX, which will eventually make its way to the ALU. Now, with the ALU having the data on the front end, we are going to choose our adding operation, which will then produce the correct result, which is stored in this accumulator. Now I need to store that result to memory. So what we did was we shut off the read operation, we allowed the accumulator access to the bus, and then we sent that data down the data bus to one of these RAM locations where we are able to write that memory. So we go into write mode, we flip, flip a clock, and then we can store the result there. In total, there were three broad steps that needed to be carried out. The first step is summarized here. We choose the ALU operation to be done. We clear the initial registers. We read the B value from address onto the data bus. We route that B value through the demultiplexer to the register, and then we finally run a clock pulse, which will store B into that temporary register. These are all the steps that need to happen before that first clock pulse. And now that the B value is correctly stored, we can move on to step two. Here we are going to read our A value from the address onto the data bus, route it through the DMUX to the front end of the ALU, and little note here, the ALU operation is performed immediately because that ALU is a combinational circuit, so we don't need an extra clock cycle to run that ALU operation. But we do need our clock pulse ending step two, in order to store the result into the accumulator. Okay, we have computed our result, and step three is all about storing that result into memory. So we activate the accumulator output, we then write that output from the data bus to the, uh, to the RAM indicated by the address, and then a clock pulse is going to end that step, it's going to allow that result to be clocked into the register. So really just three clock pulses are needed. And also we note that there's only four pieces of information that control needs to provide. We need the address of the B value. We need the address of the A value. We need the address for the output. And we also need to indicate which ALU operation is going to be done. So because we developed this microprocessor without control first, we were able to get a handle of what all the various steps need to be done before each clock pulse.
that experience is going to be invaluable to us developing a control module to accomplish these steps automatically. We are going to do that through the data path control model. All right, we, we've discussed this already, so this is just a quick recap. What we have already done is this data path. Right? That's what we have a circuit for. And then manually, we are carrying out these control signals. But now we are going to build a control model to which we're going to have external signals, such as the address uh, for the uh, various data sources, as well as a start signal to get started. Control is going to run through a sequence and that sequence will automatically spit out the control signals which control the data path. So the steps that we will walk through in this presentation are shown here. First we need to identify our states. On that earlier slide we noted that there were three steps that needed to happen before each clock pulse. We are going to add a fourth step called the idle state, which is where we are waiting for the addresses to be selected and then that start signal to be activated to begin the control sequence. So four total states, which means that we only need two flip-flops to record which state we are at. Now we are going to develop our next state table. This is going to identify the transitions between states um, in that control memory. And then based on that state, we need to identify which control signal we are going to send out. After that, we can determine the logic to transition between each state and also the logic for each control signal. So let's look at those. Here is our next state table. You'll notice that we have the four states that we listed on the previous slide. Idle represents our state zero. Load in the B data is state one. Load in the A and perform the ALU operation occurs in step two. And then finally, step three is where we store the result. After storing the result, where do we go? Oh, well, you can see here, our next state is going to be in the idle mode. Another thing to notice is that when we are in the idle state and I don't flip the start signal, we are going to remain in that idle state. But if we are in the idle state and we do activate the start signal, then we move on to the next state, which is load B. At load B, it really doesn't matter whether that start signal is activated or not. We are guaranteed to move on to the load A state. Similarly, if I'm loading A, I carry out that step and then we're guaranteed to move on to the right state. And then similarly, after the store, we move back to our initial state. At each of these states, there are various outputs, or in this case, control signals that we need to send out to tell uh, my ALU, my DMUX, my registers, what they need to be doing. Uh, for example, if we are in the idle state, and we are going to load B on the next state, right? We activate the start signal. I don't care about most of these control signals, but we do want to clear the registers to make sure we are starting from scratch. Whereas if we are currently in the load B state and then moving on to the load A state next, I want to be reading data from address one, right? That's the location of the B data. We want to be in read mode so that we are drawing data from memory onto the data bus. If I'm in read mode, we're not in write mode. I want to route data down the B line of the DMUX. So this signal must be a zero. I do not want to be clearing the registers because otherwise we won't have any data to process. And I need to be sure that the accumulator output is zero. Why? Well, only one data source should be sending data to the bus. That's coming from uh, this read operation, not from the accumulator output. And then you just continue on down the table and you'll notice huh, 
all of those steps that we listed out uh, before with these various steps are summarized more succinctly in this table. This is going to be very useful as we develop our logic next. So first, next state logic. How do we control the state memory to cycle through these indicated states? Well, first we need to choose a flip-flop type. I happen to choose D flip-flops arbitrarily. Of course, we could do this with JK or T flip-flops. Up next, we are going to complete our K map for each of these uh, instructions to control the next flip-flop states. So I show you the example for D1. The D1 instruction need to match the Q1 outputs. So uh, this K map here is made taking these as the input signals and this as the output signal. So 0, 1, x, 0, 1, and it doesn't matter what the start value is. That allows me to fill in those two ones there. And then the next one I see here comes from this row 1, 0, x, 1, 0, and it doesn't matter what the start signal is. Therefore, the equation for Q1 is most simply written as Q1 exclusive or Q0. And then you can repeat this for D0. After that, we develop the control logic. What are these output signals that we need to send to all of those various components of the microprocessor? Well, what I've done up here is simply copied over the big next state table and trimmed it down to focus on uh, the output logic. And then I just happen to pick two signals arbitrarily for which to develop the equations. So looking at the read column, I take this as the output data. These are my input signals. And then I'm able to create this K-map. From that K-map, we develop this simplified equation. And then similarly, I show the example of the accumulator output signal which gives us this k-map and this resulting equation. Okay, that's fine and good, but what does this actually accomplish for us? And this is where we see the whole point of what we are doing with this control module. Right? We just showed that the equation for the accumulator output should be q1 ended with q0. Before, I needed a manual switch in order to tell when that accumulator, uh, that it can have access to the data bus. Now I have replaced that switch with a simple AND gate to perform Q1 ANDed with Q0. As long as I know what state I'm in, well then that state tells me uh, when this buffer should allow the data to pass through. Instead of manual control, we now have automatic control. The last kind of confusing part of uh, this next state table is the address generator. Right, notice that this looks different than any of the other signals over here. Here I give a number for what address we want to be accessing. And that leads to this circuit. Okay, let's break it down. We have a decoder over here, which is based on what our current state is. Depending on that state, I'm going to access one of these addresses. So for example, uh, if my state reads 1, 1, well, that means we are activating Q3, address 3, which is containing the address for the specific output. And then that output gets passed down this data bus, which gets sent to that decoder. This is the same decoder that we used in the original microprocessor, which is going to activate one of the ROM or the RAM registers uh, built into our memory bank. So let's watch this in action in LogicWorks. All right, here we have it. 
Here I'm going to drop start signal low. And the first thing I want you to focus on is purely the top half of this circuit. Right? This contains the state memory within the flip-flops, as well as the next state logic, which tells us how we are jumping from one state to the next. While my start signal is low, we remain in that idle state 0, 0. But once we turn it on, we are going to notice the sequence cycle through. And I'll just leave start on so we continue watching the cycle. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, and then back down to 0. And then what effect does this have on the address generator? Well, I put these binary probes here just so we can watch which of these uh, decoder signals are being activated. 3, 1, 6 then nothing. Three, one, six, then nothing. Okay, where is that sequence coming from? Oh, look, address one is a three, address two is a one, address three is a six. Three, one, six, get activated in turn. And then what about the case where all of these are X's, right? None of these address signals are being activated. Well, that's when we are in state zero, zero, right? Notice that this is connected to nothing. Therefore, when we are in state zero, zero, none of these three addresses work their way to the bus. There's simply no signal being passed in as the address. But we cycle through in sequence. Let's take in that B data. Let's take in the A data. Let's identify where the output register is. And then lastly, in that idle state, right, when start is low, in that idle state, we want to be accessing none of these registers. Therefore, none of these address signals are activated. Alrighty. So with those components, we can piece together the control module of our microprocessor. So everything down below is very similar to the microprocessor already demonstrated. Up here we have our control model and this little black box is just my attempt to hide a tiny bit of the work. Although you can still see some of the signals, uh, you can uh, kind of guess uh, what this logic is doing. Uh, I hide that just so you have a little bit of work to do when you build this circuit yourself. But let's look at the control up top. We have the state memory, which indicates what state we are in. We have the clock connected both to the state memory as well as to all of the registers in the circuit. We have the next state logic, uh, indicated by these two sets of gates here, that simply controls how the states update. Uh, this series of AND gates is just useful for us monitoring. We get to watch which state we are currently in. And then over here is the address generator that was just discussed. Notice that the address from that address generator gets passed down this bus to the device address decoder with the exact same setup in the microprocessor that we watched before. And then down here in the black box, this is the control signal logic, which is sending out the instructions of, hey, DMUX, you should route to A or you should route to B, right? Depending on what state we are currently in. All right, let's demonstrate this in action. Uh, I'm going to perform a bitwise OR operation on decimal values six and three. Let's store the value 6 in ROM 2. Let's store the value 3 in ROM 0. And then let's choose the bitwise OR operation, which is a 1. Now we need to choose the addresses of where that data is located. I wrote this in ROM 2. I wrote the A value in ROM 0. And then where do we want to write the output? 
Uh, I have three RAM options here, five, six, or seven. Let's just choose five. So now I have all the external signals prepped and I simply need to flip the start switch. You'll notice that idle updates to load. We pass through those various load states. We go into the store state, back down to idle, and we are going to remain in the idle state. Well, it doesn't look like much happened, but we look down in RAM 5 where we wrote our output, and sure enough, the expected result is stored there. Well, I did not have to manually flip all those switches. I chose my input information, I flipped the start switch, and I let this processor process automatically. All right, let's hit that start switch again, and you will notice that as the states change, both the address, hex display changes, as well as the value on the data bus changes. All right, pretty fascinating to watch it. I understand it's difficult simply to watch a video and understand all the complexity of what's going on here. This is why you need to build it yourself, explore what each of those signals are doing, and then watch the values change when it is running through the sequence.